How's it going everyone and welcome back to another video. In this video I'm going to be going over a Volkswagen that presented with an overheating fault. This Volkswagen started off with an intermittent overheating and then had a breakdown where it overheated on the side of the road. In this video I'm going to be sharing with you what that problem was and some of the steps you can use to help diagnose that fault. Okay, so I thought I'd make this video because I thought it would be very useful to a lot of people out there. As we progress and systems change, there is some differences that you need to be aware of when you're trying to diagnose some of these faults. So if you have a Volkswagen 1.6 or 2 liter engine, TDI, you may have the same fault that I have in this video. What I was experiencing when I got the vehicle was it was overheating straight away. It was a uh, didn't take long. I confirmed that off the coolant temperature sensor and also off the gauge and like the customer stated it was intermittent at the start so sometimes the gauge got up high but it would go back to normal and then all of a sudden it was rapid up to up to the red and they weren't able to drive. They were broke down at the side of the road. Some of the steps I use to diagnose this can be comparable with the old style methods of um, testing a coolant system but there are some key differences you need to be aware of on the likes of this system. So when you will come across an overheating fault like this one of the things you would spring to your mind is levels. You want to check the coolant level, you want to make sure that everything is like present in the system, you want to make sure that there is heat generating in the cabin where there's not air in the system so you're checking for leaks and you're doing them common checks. I'm happy to say that in this one everything was fine in that area. There was no visible leaks, there was no visible issues, everything on the common side of checks of why you would have a vehicle overheating was absolutely fine. What was happening was the water pump was not circulating correctly. Now on old style methods of water pumps what you could do is check coolant flow so you would at the expansion tank potentially take off a pipe and check for the circulation of the water pump. On older Volkswagens there was issues with the impellers becoming detached or blades being damaged and not circulating the coolant around like it should. I have had those issues in the past and by check checking coolant flow you are able to confirm that type of fault. In these ones they have an electronic water pump so they have an actuated water pump that helps circulate the coolant around. That's worked by a diverter shield that's on top of the water pump and the electronic solenoid comes on and off moving that diverter shield on and off which circulates the coolant. Now in some systems you may have one, two or potentially three water pumps in these newer vehicles so you need to be aware that the circulation flow can be different from one to another. Them older checks that you would be used to doing might not necessarily give you all the answers you want to confirm the fault. So some of the key things that I looked for on this which made it straightforward was service history. Lucky enough this customer owned this vehicle for a very long period of time and I was able to see that the water pump and timing belt had never been changed at all. I did do active tests so I activated that water pump to see if I could hear a clicking noise on the solenoid to see if it was sending power down there. It was, it was active and I confirmed to the customer after a very short period of time that I wanted to get in and check that water pump fully. I suspected strongly with the checks that I had done that that diverter shield was getting stuck. That would indicate why it was intermittent previously, that would indicate why it had failed completely afterwards and with the time and bell history never been done and had been well overdue it was a no-brainer that this customer was given the go-ahead to get the water pump and time bell changed and when I have the water pump out I can visibly check 100% and see if that's what actually happened. So what I have here is the water pump that was the failure on this vehicle so if you're having that fault I very very much 
um, suspect that you could be having the exact same issue as I'm having. I'm gonna switch the camera around. I'm gonna give you a close up of exactly what was happening with this and some of the tests you could do uh, bench wise to confirm that this has failed on your vehicle. Some of you are not gonna have the ability to command uh, and do a bi-directional command on this water pump, which I had, I could check the solenoid to make sure that that was becoming active. I could hear the click. Um, one of the potential tests you could do is a pressure pulse um, sensor check. So checking um, how much pulse differential in the coolant system happens after you would activate this. That's a, a possibility. I don't have that um, tester myself, but if you have that, maybe you would be able to confirm the fault without uh, removing the component out of it. So I'm just gonna switch the camera over and I'm gonna give you a very close up of this unit. Okay, so what I have here is that failed water pump. So on a normal system, on the old school method, you wouldn't have this type of shield here at all. The belt, because uh, the timer belt runs off this water pump, will just spin that around and you will be circulating coolant throughout the system consistently. With these newer advancement, be, be it electronic thermostats or electronically controlled solenoids to activate these diverter shields, they are trying to create um, more fuel efficient engines by controlling the temperature of that engine uh, with more efficiency. So these types of things uh, weren't in older systems. So that's why you need to be aware when testing things have changed. This diverter shield here gets commanded. This solenoid here pushes pressure up through and that shield goes up and covers. So it stops the water pump from circulating the coolant around like it would. So when I pulled this unit out, this was completely jammed. It actually took a good bit to get it to pop down. It should go like that and afterwards it should pop straight back into position. So the intermittent uh, fault that happens is when it sticks partially and then comes down or maybe doesn't close it off completely and has partial circulation. With this one, there was no fault codes whatsoever as well. So don't be fooled by thinking you will have fault codes on the system. This was a no fault code um, fault nothing stored and you do have to do the checks required. So one of the checks you could do is you could apply voltage direct to that or you can take out the solenoid valve and you can apply air pressure direct in there to see the shield move up and down. But if you have any restriction, if you have any stickiness and it's not flowing back out like it should, this part needs to be replaced. If you have covered timer belt range mileage on the likes of these, strongly, strongly advise replacing it. With every timer belt change, I recommend replacing this item. The, um, the issues you will have will leave you stuck at the side of the road should this fail and you will have to go and do the time and belt all over again. Even though it's an extra cost on, type of, on top of a time and belt service, I would highly, highly advise doing it to, um, to eliminate any of those possibilities. So I'm gonna take this out here just so I can demonstrate to you what actually happens when pressure is applied through there. Just imagine coolant flow and then a solenoid valve being commanded, which is this unit here. And I'm just gonna put some air pressure in here, move that back out of the way so you can see this command on. But after the pressure releases, that should retract back afterwards. So I got my air jet hooked up to the compressor. I'm just gonna put it straight in there and apply a little bit of compressed air through it. And as you can see, it shuts up, completely closes off, but that should retract afterwards. That should pop back down instead of jamming.
if you look down in the center there as I apply this pressure you can see where it pushes up through right in there okay so that is how that diverter shield on blocking the impeller here works this is simply a 12 volt type system so it's a two pin commands it on and then this solenoid becomes active so i've hooked up two connectors here onto this little solenoid i have a battery voltage just over here where i'm going to be applying this too and then I will show you close up the solenoid working so you can see that little solenoid acting on and off as I click which creates a flow and a circulation from this unit through there Okay, and that is it for this video. That is how this system works. That is some of the ways on how you can test it. Like anything, you gotta go through step-by-step -step processes to try and diagnose these faults correctly. But having the correct information on how a system works, knowing that you have a diverter shield covering an impeller will help you to diagnose these problems more accurately so you will be able to fix these issues for the customer. Like any coolant issue that you have, make sure that you bleed up the system correctly afterwards, follow the steps required applicable to your vehicle. But I thought this would be very good information for anyone that's out there who's working on these uh, engines, that if you didn't know that that's how these water pumps work, you now do. I really hope you found this video useful and informative. If you did, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I hope to see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.